<laughs> my name is Kelly. And my name is Tantha. And you know, this morning it really is such a joy and privilege that Kelly and I are able to lead in the time of worship this morning. But you know, before we go into a time of worship, let's begin with coming to the Lord in prayer and asking that he will be with us. Let's pray. Our dearest Heavenly Father, Lord, we want to thank you so much for keeping us throughout the week, for bringing us here to your house again. Lord, today, as we come to bring you praise, may you please empty our hearts and our minds of the things that distract us, so that we may bring you great worship, Lord. Father, we want to pray that as we hear a word today, that you'll please open our hearts to receive this word, that our faith may grow. And Lord, today, as we come for communion, help us not to take for granted what you have done for us. Help us to prepare our hearts to take this communion, knowing what you have done. We want to pray that you'll be with us today, Lord, and pray that you will find our worship acceptable. In Jesus' name we pray. So we are now in the month of June, halfway through the year, and it is also the second month that we are taking up this theme of I um, will bless you. And you know, when I first heard about this theme, I, I really, really looked forward to learning especially when I um, found out that it was going to be taken from Genesis. Um, and the book of Genesis is, is a book that's close to my heart because it is a book that I um, first got to outline in detail with Pastor Chris guiding me along the way. Um, and with this book as well, I had the great privilege to um, take up training for sun, uh, junior Sunday school teaching. So. Um, this was in 2015, and we took about one and a half years to finish the book of Genesis with the Junior Sunday School. You know, it's um, really so special to me when there is time taken to read the Lord's Word because the Lord wonderfully teaches us. And you know, for myself, um, you know, it, it, it's exciting for me to read a book again, a book that I've already read. And yet still have um, a desire and an excited spirit to look forward to learning um, with anticipation that the Lord will teach afresh and that he will, you know, bring about something new and inspirational. And for me, these, uh, this past month, wonderfully, revisiting Genesis is how... Um, I have seen this. It really has been wonderful to learn new lessons that the Lord has given and to see how God's everlasting word brings about new appreciation as um, we seek to apply it into our lives as well. Now, as Tab and I reflected on the messages heard um, and the promise of God's blessing to us, we couldn't help but go back to um, Genesis 17 and meditate on this everlasting covenantal relationship that the Lord offers us from himself. You know, in Genesis 17, verse 7, it reads, And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you in their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and your descendants after you. You know, for myself, the word everlasting has been a challenging concept to apply in my life. You know, the t um, in today, the idea of everlasting um, is only just a concept because a lot of people just live in the present. You know, they only think of now or they only think of a few years ahead of them. For example, um, students may say in their life now, how am I gonna pass my next exam? You know, um, or young people, I need to be in a relationship right now. Right now is the time. And then if you are in uni and going to graduate soon, or if you're in your current job, what job will I have next in, in the next few years? When is my next holiday going to be? And you know, I just want to travel and live in another country while I'm young. Or you know, can I work to afford a new car? Or you know, what will my next house be? And these are the kind of thoughts that Many people can, many people have, and maybe you can relate to them too. You know, for me, some of those thoughts are um, very real, and maybe some very legitimate as well. 
But you know when our hearts and minds are so filled with these everyday concerns, it is hard for us to be able to fathom this everlasting covenant, you know? It, because we're so caught up in the present. And, you know, in this beautiful relationship that God offers us, He's already laid out everything that He will do for us. In Genesis chapter 17, verse um, 2 and verse 6 to 8, He tells us how He wants to bless us, you know? It gives us a glimpse of his thoughts and his desires for us. I will multiply you. I will make you exceedingly fruitful. I will make nations of you. I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants. I will be their God. Now this is God's very own will and desire. And it is to bless us. In seeing God's will within this beautiful relationship that we can have with him. You know, my, my own concerns seem so small. And I really, really thank God that he offers us this everlasting covenantal relationship with him through the Lord Jesus Christ that we can have too. And, you know, this, this covenant, this everlasting covenant can be applied to how I see my life and how I live in response to the Lord. Now, with this thought, it is such a great reason this morning to lift our voices in praise to the Lord, to a wonderful God, you know, who desires to bless us. And our first song titled this morning, The Wonder of It All, you know, it sings how we just stand in awe, that God would love us, that God would choose to bless us, and establish this everlasting covenant with us. You know, may our lives be lived in understanding and response to a great and glorious covenant that God will establish between us. Let us take up our first song together this morning. Thank you all for your singing. So as Kelly mentioned, the theme for this month is, I will bless you. And you know, this is one that I'm really thankful that we have been studying. The story of Abraham from the book of Genesis and looking at the Lord's blessings has been very enlightening to me and has caused me to reflect a lot on the person of God. So in the example of Abraham, a man who would go on to be recognized throughout history till now as a man of faith, I really just appreciate the realness in his initial walk with the Lord. You know, he would make a mistake and then repeat that mistake. And then he would rely on his own wisdom and get himself into very serious problems. But I appreciate learning about his very real struggles he had about learning to trust in God because this whole journey just shows us the amazing person of God. You know, God who evidently demonstrates his love and his patience towards Abraham. And you know, beyond merely saving him from these self-created problems, the Lord guided Abraham in righteousness and he taught him how to walk closer so God could continue to bless. As Kelly mentioned, the passage that stood out to the both of us upon reflection was Genesis 17. And the verse that stood out to me was verse 1, when God said, I am almighty God, walk before me, and be blameless. The reason that this passage strikes me so much is because God gave two simple instructions, walk before me and be blameless. And as Kelly listed, in return, he wants to outpour countless blessings toward us. Another thought that I have held on to for a few weeks now is a question that was asked at Sunday school a few weeks ago. And it was the difference between blessings from God and between his mercy. And the answer was that most of the things in our lives is because God is merciful to us. And when he blesses, it's simply because he is good. And when I ponder these two thoughts together, I come back to Psalm 5 verse 12, where it says, For you, O Lord, will bless the righteous. 
with favor you will surround him as with a shield. You know, I'm not a righteous person, in fact, sinful, but because of God, because of who he is, I can seek to follow those two instructions so that we, because this is what he wants for us. He doesn't want to just stop at showing us mercy, but in fact, he wants to bless us. And it is up to us to seek to walk before him and to be blameless. You know how truly precious it is that we have a God who wants to shower us in blessings that we are not deserving of. And me personally, I just think that is so amazing. And you know, the most appropriate way that I can think for us to respond to a God who is so good to us is to praise his most worthy name. The song that I have chosen for us this morning is Trust and Obey, number 349. And I chose this song because I feel like it really echoes all the lessons that we have been learning from Abraham's life. And today, as we take up the word shortly and partake in communion later, may we learn to seek God with all our hearts, to walk before him and to be blameless. So I invite you all to stand and we'll sing our song, Trust and Obey. Thank you. You may be seated and we'll pass this time over to Pastor Chris. Thanks, ladies. We're going to pray together, and then we are going to learn further about what it means for God to bless us, and then how do we understand that blessing in our life. Okay, well, we're going to pray, and uh, we're going to think of those who are unwell. It's been a already winter is already here, and uh, people are falling sick left, right, center. So if you're a little bit unwell, we please practice hygiene wherever we can, okay? And uh, of course, we're going to think of our Deacon Henry especially. He's gone for his radiotherapy treatment. It's already begun, and he's just feeling a little bit... He's here this morning, but he's just feeling a, a lack of energy. So he will not be uh, serving communion. He's just concerned he's not able to carry... Uh, the tray with a whole lot of strength. So we're going to get uh, the, the future leaders in training to assist in communion this morning. He's got a few more uh, sessions to go. Uh, well, let's remember him in, in prayer. Remember all who are maybe treat, getting treatment. You just need that strength. And you are weak and like that. A blessing of strength. Strength in itself is a blessing. Okay, well, let's pray together. Our Father, we bow in prayer, thanking you that we can come to you, bringing to you our concerns, our needs in life. And we ask that you would give to us that strength to cope with whatever we need to face. We think of our brethren who, is not, who are not well, battling um, illness, especially the older ones, and they fall sick, it can be really painful. We think of uh, uh, Deacon Henry, that you would uphold him and grant to him the strength he needs to battle cancer. And to all who are maybe here this morning, they too are battling cancer, we ask that that grace would be given. We pray that our hearts could be encouraged once again as we come to seek a word in season from you. And as we read the scriptures, we get, ask that you would give to us that understanding to know how to look at life and how to understand it and how to put our trust in you, even as we face all these things. We pray that you would bless us. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, we turn to the book of Genesis once again. And Genesis is filled with the stories of Abraham, of Isaac, of Jacob, and this morning we are going to read the story of Joseph. You know, what are these stories? Why were they recalled? Why were they recorded? And I need, we need to understand that. They're not just, you know, we all have our own stories, 
we have family stories. This is very much stories passed down from one generation to the next generation. What does it tell us? What are the lessons that we are to learn? And an important lesson to learn is actually God's hand in life. When did Abraham's life turn around? Where you see God's hand began to be involved in Genesis 12. Right? So we have been reading for the whole month of May, in fact, the life of Abraham and God's hand in his life. God's promise of blessing, but not only a promise of blessing, but His hand there involved, His hand of protection, His hand of provision, His presence there. The challenge is to be able to understand God's hand and to see it, right? His hand is there in the life of This morning, we're going to read Joseph's life. In fact, the next few uh, weeks, we are going to take a look at towards the end part of Genesis. Okay, we don't have a chance to read every single part of it. But we are, the point of it all is to see and understand God's hand in life. And that's not easy. It really is not easy. But we are going to try. Okay, Uh, first and foremost we see how God does promise wonderful blessings. How do we see that? How does it become a reality in our life? Now, let's turn to Deuteronomy uh, 28.2. This is our Bible memory verse to begin with. Deuteronomy becomes a book that was taught. Genesis, a narrative. Deuteronomy's focus is From the narrative, how do we understand God's blessing? And now it becomes a teaching for the people, right? For the future, for the generation that was there. Okay, now we read in Deuteronomy 28 verse 2. It's in your bulletin, these words uh, about how the Lord would bless. Okay, now let's read that together, chapter 28 verse 2. And we read, And all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you because you obey the voice of the Lord your God. And the important word there is the word because. Right? Here is a promise. There is potential, but it's just potential. How will it be? Come actual in life. The word is because you obeyed the voice of the Lord your God. So Abraham learned to obey the voice of the Lord. Right? So did Jacob, Isaac. So did Jacob. And so does all. And when we learn to obey the voice of the Lord our God, we will see the reality of His blessings in life and not before, right? Concept, yes, here is a teaching. Here is a truth principle. But how does it become actual? Okay, well, let's, let's uh, take time to, to read again uh, Genesis. And this time round, we are going to see these blessings Reality in the life of the person called Joseph. Okay? Well, let's read this together. Perhaps we have read his life story before. Well, let's read it afresh. Like I like what Kelly said. She's outlined it. Wonderful. Let's read it afresh. Let's see what else we can learn. You'll be surprised what you can learn. Okay? Now, we turn to Genesis 37. And we are going to, it, it, the life of Joseph begins here. Okay? And it is not easy to understand God's hand. It really isn't. 
And we see it in the beginning part of it. Now, we, we got to read this. Did Joseph understand God's plan, God's hand in his life when he was younger? The answer is no. Okay, well, let's read this. Jacob dwelt in the land, that's his father. He was a stranger there. This is the history of Jacob. And we read, Joseph, being 17 years old, that was his age, was feeding the flock with his brothers, right? And he had 11 brothers that was there. Verse 3, we read, Israel, actually Israel is Jacob, same person, all right? Jacob, he was renamed uh, Israel. He loved Joseph more than all his children, this is not good. Okay? There is partiality. You are favorite one son over the other, one child over the other. What happens? It creates problems in your family. And it did in his. Because he was the son of his old age, he made him a tunic of many wonderful colors. And when his brothers saw that their father loved him more, they hated him and could not speak peaceably with him. All right? And, and there is a problem. The brothers hate him. Now, to make matters worse, okay? He was not a very mature person. This is called a problem of immaturity. So when we are immature, partly because of age, partly because of a lack of understanding in life, Right? We cannot see God's hand. We really cannot properly. And so he had a dream. And God actually intimated to him that he will become someone great. Now, I don't know whether you have ever thought, ever imagined you could become someone great one of these days. See, we don't think about things like that. We just think about survival, get a job, get this, get that. Okay, but we don't think about greatness. Not in the world's eyes. But look at this, greatness is there, right? And so God, the dream was there. He told the dream they hated him even more. Well, what on earth was this dream? And so he says to them, without understanding, without a lot, whole lot of maturity. Please listen to the dream I have dreamed. And he said, There we were binding sheaves in the field. Then behold, my sheaf arose and also stood upright. Your sheaves stood around and bowed down to my sheaves. <laughs> Obviously why they hated him. Right? So when we don't understand things, you know, we just say it, you can, you can offend. And they were so angry. They were already angry with him. You, you know, your favorite son of my father. Well, they, now they hate him. Okay, now, he had another dream. And so he, of course, the brother said, will you indeed reign over us? And so, and have dominion. They didn't understand that dream and they didn't want to understand it. He, they just think he is just being very cheeky here. So they hated him even more. Now, he doesn't get it. Now. See, when people are immature, they don't know when to stop. Right? When people are angry with you, stop. Right? You told a joke, it wasn't funny. And you know what? Can I tell you another joke? You know, you are going to get it, aren't you? So, <laughs> he doesn't get it. So, look at this. He dreamed another dream and <laughs> told his brother. <laughs> this time round, he also told his father. And he said, no, no, no more sheaves. Look, this time, the sun and the moon and the 11 stars bound down to me. Now it's stars and moon and, and stars. 
and he told it to his father. No, his brother loved him, remember? He made him a beautiful coat. But his father was angry, didn't understand it. And so he and his brothers rebuked him and said, What is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall your mother and I, your brothers, indeed bow down to the earth before you? Right? See, very hard. How do I, did I under, did he understand God's hand? Even if God gives you an intimation, if you have no maturity, you don't understand it. You have no clue what it means. You just tell it. Oh yeah, your, your sheep's bound down to mine. The stun's bound down to mine. And that created more problem. They were so angry, right? The father sent them him one day, and we know this story. The brothers plotted to kill him. And they didn't kill him. They sold him into slavery. That was how bad things got in the family. And it's painful. You see, sometimes the pain can occur in the family when there is a lack of immaturity. You said something you should not, you didn't understand, you said it, and it can be painful when there is no understanding. Right? Even if it's an intimation from God, do you understand it? Okay? Now, we read now uh, how he was... Okay, many, he, he got sold into slavery and they sold him into uh, Egypt under this man called Potiphar. Now, we've got to turn to very quickly chapter 39. Okay, so we're going to read very, very quickly. Just highlighting, tracing God's hand here. Okay, now, we begin to see God's hand a little bit better here. Now, let's take a look at this. What's going to make all the difference? He was there, taken down to Egypt, Potiphar, officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, bought him. And then, right? So he was a slave there in Egypt. Really tough. Sold by your own brother. Right? They were angry. They just hated him. They want to get rid of him. And that's how they thought they would get rid of him separated from the father he loved. Now, life cannot get any worse at this point. You are sold into a foreign country as a slave. What do you do? 17 years old, young lad. Now, we read something very special. Verse 2, the Lord was with Joseph. Now, you begin to see this. And he was a successful man. Can you succeed? Even though the odds are against you. Yes, if the Lord is with you. Now watch this very carefully. Because it was so obvious that Potiphar, the master, saw that the Lord was with him and made all he did prosper in his hand. Right? So what makes the difference in life? What can make all the difference? The Lord with you. If the Lord is with you, you, He can prosper you wherever you are. And so Joseph succeeded. He became, uh, you know, he was given authority He was made to be an overseer of the house of Potiphar. The Lord blessed the Egyptian's house. Because of him, Potiphar's household is blessed. The blessing of the Lord was on all that he had in the house. Of course, this made him very happy. Ever since you come in, ever since you work for me, I have nothing but success. And so he promoted him to become the chief steward of that household. He left everything to Joseph's hand. Right? Now, here is a problem. The wife. Not not, not Joseph. Joseph didn't have a wife then. It was Potiphar's wife. Now, Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. That's the problem. Sometimes too handsome, also no good. 
right? And so it came to pass where the master's wife was, master's wife cast longing eyes on Joseph. You know, looked at him one too, too long. The more she looked, the more she said, I, I like this guy, I want this guy. And said to him, lie with me. And he refused and said to the master's wife, listen to what he says, look, my master does not know what is with me in this house. Why? Because he has committed everything he has to my hand. There is no one greater in this house than I nor has he kept back anything from me but you. Because you are his wife, how can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? He is no longer immature. Good, he's grown up. And sometimes you need challenges, difficulties, you grow up. He now has this wonderful thing called integrity. Immaturity, now we see integrity. When God bless you, would you be faithful to God? And God did. Everything He touched, successful. Would you sin against God? He says, no. This, my master has given everything. He has entrusted me with such high responsibility. I will not sin against my master nor God. There is called integrity. You see, the, the, you see God's hand in the life of this person now? That's what faith is. That's what it means to have trust. This is what it means to be a person of integrity. He had integrity and the Lord blessed him. I will not take advantage, in other words, of my master, of the things that I have. I will not sin against God. Now, in the past, he didn't speak about God. Now he speaks about God. There's a change. Okay? Now there's a change. Now he did that, and of course the women got angry, and when women get angry, it's very difficult. And wow, how dare you reject me? I cast my longing eyes at you, and all that, right? And said to the husband, this is blamed it on him. He tried to take advantage of me, and the husband put Joseph into an Egyptian prison. Now, this is a downturn in life. You went from doing so well because you had integrity. Now you're suffering for it. Will you now be upset? Did you see this? Will you suffer for your integrity? Will you still do the right thing? Even if you have to take a downturn, can you see God's hand? See, can't see it. Not yet. Not at this point. Not in Canaan, not in Egypt, not in Potiphar's house, just yet. When you can't see God's hand, what do you do? You learn to trust in the Lord with integrity in your heart. He did not lose his faith. He did not lose his faith either, even when he was thrown into prison. Now, we read this very carefully. In verse 21, the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy, gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. The keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hand all the prisoners that was in prison. Whatever they did there, it was his doing, right? From organizing Potiphar's house to organizing the prison. Now, we read, the keeper of the prison did not look into anything that was under Joseph's authority, meaning entrusted everything, because, we read, the Lord was with him. Whatever he did, the Lord made it prosper. You see this? Whether you are here or whether you are in prison, it doesn't matter. We so often think, if, if only I could be here, I could do this, I could do that. And the Lord is not there. Will it succeed? It won't. But if the Lord is with you, it doesn't matter where you're at. He will prosper your hand. 
you will succeed. You see the difference? You, we've got to see God's hand in this story, the life of Joseph. Right? Now, we go on further, okay? And you think, why God put me here? Was there a reason? And sometimes we think in life, why did God put me in this place? Why am I doing here? It's a good thing he was in prison at the right place at the right time. Because that, in the world's word, is that's where he got his break. Because the two servants of Pharaoh was there, one's a butler, one's, you know, they both served in Pharaoh's court, and they had a dream, and because Joseph's was, Joseph was there, he has now learned, he has grown to see and understand the hand of God in life. He interpreted the dreams and gave to them what God was saying to them. One will die, one will be restored. And of course, he tells the butler, hey, when I am restored, please remember me. And true enough, in three days, the butler was restored back to his court. But he forgot Joseph, left him there for the next two years. Right? You're forgotten. You're forgotten by the people you do good to. You, can, can you still hold on to your faith in God? Will you still trust God? Will you still walk in integrity? You see, this is a test. Real test. Now, two years later, this time around, Pharaoh had a dream. Okay? This is not just any dream. This time around, he was so troubled. And then now the the person remembers, oh yeah, when I was in prison, uh, somebody told me, the dream, interpreted my dream, and this person could tell and, and explain things, and it happened. And so Pharaoh called Joseph. And there Joseph was. Well, let's take a look at this, how he was able to do this. In chapter 41, and look how Joseph spoke. Pharaoh sent, called Joseph, bring him quickly, Right? And then uh, read, said to him, I have had a dream. No one can interpret it, but I have heard that it is you that you can understand dream to interpret it. Listen to what Joseph says. I like what he says. In verse 16, Joseph answered, saying, It is not me. God will give Pharaoh an answer of peace. Wow. Okay, now you are able to speak of God like that. God will give you an answer. Okay, now what is the dream? And God intimated to Pharaoh, actually, a disaster that could have wiped Egypt out. Seven years of famine. Now that is serious. There will be seven good years. See, sometimes we don't know how to uh, plan if God doesn't give us the wisdom, the good years can be over. We don't know how to plan for the hard times that come. The good years are over. Seven years of famine can come. And if you had not have any place in plan, you don't know how to see God's hand in life, you're in serious trouble. Joseph you see, this is why we need to understand the hand of God, not just in personal life, but in the whole country. If God is intimating, is there anyone who understands? Is there anyone who has the wisdom to plan for the future like this? No one like Joseph was what Pharaoh said. And then, this is what Pharaoh said, verse 38, can we find such a man as whom has the Spirit of God? Right? His wisdom, his discernment, inasmuch as God has shown you all this, there is no one as discerning, as wise as you. Wow. It's not just prospering. You, there is no one as wise as you. You see, God has blessed him. 
And then Joseph recognized this too, right? He had two children. He named one of them Manasseh, meaning the name of the firstborn Manasseh, God has made me forget all the toil of my father's house. Right? The second one he named Ephraim, God has caused me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. Right? God has blessed you. But do you understand why? Why has God brought you to Egypt? Why has God made you great here? Is there a reason? He didn't understood stand it. He didn't understand it then. But until he began to realize when his own brothers came. No food in the land. It's just not Egypt. There was the famine. It has hit and it has hit hard. There is completely nothing in the land. Everywhere else. His father sent his, his sons, go to Egypt. We hear there is, there is uh, grain there. Go there and buy some grain. And then they didn't realize, they didn't recognize the person who was going to sell them grain was none other than the brother that they sold into slavery. Okay? We read this in verse 22. When in verse, verse 42, sorry, verse 8, Joseph recognized his brother, but they did not recognize him. And we read, Joseph remembered the dreams which he had dreamed about them. Now, this time round is very different. He was no longer immature. Now, there is integrity. There is influence on his part. He became the most powerful person in Egypt. Next to Pharaoh, nobody else is as great as Joseph. Integrity, no longer immaturity. There is integrity. There is influence. Why has God given you all this influence? You need one more thing. It's called insight. Do you see now? Now he understands his dream. Insight. Now, we read this in chapter 45. Okay? From chapter 20, 43, 43 to 45, Joseph came up with a very elaborate plan to test whether his brothers are you know, still uh, like the old self or whether they have changed. That, that's the part of it. right? You can read that yourself. And then he sees that they have changed. They, he sees the way they are defending their brothers. They are you know, speaking the truth. Now he tells them. Look at the insight that is here now. In chapter 45, we read, in verse 4, he says to his brothers, please come to me, right? They couldn't recognize him. Then he said, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. I think at this point in time, you would have died. You hated him, you, you sold him, you were sold. Now the brother is your boss. See? Don't sell anyone out, okay? You don't even know. Things can turn around and haunt you for the rest of your life. Oh, this brother is now the most powerful man. Live or die is in his hand. They bowed down to him, remember? He couldn't understand the dream. He couldn't understand the intimation. Now he does. But now with maturity... With his immature past, he would have probably killed them all. But now he is mature. Now he has wisdom. Now he is a person of integrity. Now he has, look at this. Influence must be given to a person with maturity, not immaturity. A person with influence and immaturity is disaster. He says to them, now, inside, he says, God sent me. Okay, verse 5, you do not be grieved or angry with yourselves that you sold me here. Wow, he's really making a point, huh? You, you sold me here. 
right? But God sent me before you to preserve life. See? God's hand. I can understand it now. I can see why I am blessed. Why God has put me in Egypt. Why bless me in Egypt? Why did I go to prison? He had to go to prison to have an interview. We can't see God's hand. God knows what He is doing. And we trust Him. Now I know why. God sent me here before you to preserve life. Look what else He says. To as it were, preserve a posterity for you and the children, a posterity for the people of God, a future. Your children will die in the famine. God sent me here. He keep on saying that, right? And then we read in verse 7, God sent me to preserve a posterity for you in the earth, to save your lives by great deliverance. So now it was not you who sent me here, but God. And he made me a father to Pharaoh, lord of all his house, and a ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. Insight. Now you can see God's hand. Why God has blessed you. Have you ever asked yourself why God has placed you where you are? with the influence that you have, can you see that you may make an impact to the lives of many? Because now he can make that impact. He's going to make an impact. Without him, Egypt would have perished with the famine. Without him, his families would have perished. This is where can we see God's hand. And the challenge this morning is to read this and to understand the hand of God in our life. We learn to trust Him. We learn to have faith in Him. We learn to have integrity in our heart. And if God has blessed you with influence and insight, what an impact you can be. What an impact you can be. You, you see this? God's blessing is not just for, okay, thank you, God. I'm so blessed. Why God bless you? Right? Why has God taken you out? You were struggling. Now you have done well. Now you have able to improve the lives of other people. But you need this thing called insight. You need to be able to see, well, this is why. You can say, God sent me here for this reason. God has given, this is the purpose, this is the impact I can make. Remember, he was making an impact wherever he was already. What is the key phrase? The Lord was with him. The Lord prospered him. Whether it is in Potiphar's house, whether it is in prison, now, the position he is given to impact all of Egypt. And he turned it around. Egypt survived seven years of famine. The whole nation, all the nations around them survived that famine because Joseph was there. And the challenge this morning is to see God's hand. Can we see them? Maybe you're young right now. Well, grow up a bit, okay? You, but you learn to trust God. Okay, right? Those who are 13 year old, you learn to trust. 17 year olds, you learn. Immaturity is there, but you learn to trust. You learn to become a person of integrity. God has blessed you. Don't sin against Him. Walk with Him, honor Him, speak of Him. Don't take the credit. God is the one who can give these things. True. And let God hand. Help, help you understand why He has brought you here, to be that blessing. Okay? I, I, I don't know whether this, this word challenges your heart. It certainly does for me. 
to see where I came from. Born in Malaysia, one year old, migrated to Christmas Island, grew up in Christmas Island, came to Perth, went through boarding school here, went to Singapore for three years, came back here. Where am I supposed to be? Then you begin to realize God's hand in life. Why has God blessed me the way He has? Is there a reason? Is there a purpose? And then you begin to realize this is why God sent you here to make that impact. Bless God. Praise His name. Is this, is this possible for all of us? Absolutely. What does it take? Faith. Find that faith. Have faith. Keep that faith. No matter what comes, continue. Don't lose that faith until we see the hand of God slowly unfold, revealed to us. Okay? Well, let's pray together. Our Father, we pray this morning, even as we prepare our hearts for communion, may our hearts be encouraged to see your hand in life. Sometimes it's so hard to see. It really is hard. When we lack maturity, when we go to trials, afflictions, we can't see the good that is coming forth. When we even go through downturns, we pray that you would help us to be encouraged by the story of Joseph, to hold firm to our faith, to not lose faith, to continue to walk in our integrity, to not sin against you, and to see you bless. Give to us the insight we need to discern your hand. And may we indeed be a blessing. Help us to prepare our hearts now for communion. And may we learn to deepen our love for the Lord Jesus Christ through communion too. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's prepare our hearts for communion this morning. Okay, well, we just read from ch chapter 37 to 45, not bad. The point is not reading everything, it's just to hopefully you can see the hand that is there, the hand of God. And our challenge is to see the hand of God in our own life. And we need the Lord to encourage us along the way, because sometimes we really think we have failed the Lord. I don't know whether you have, there are times where you, you think, you know what, I, have, I just feel like a failure. Is there still any hope in me? Listen to this poem that is written for communion. It's taken from John 21, where Jesus restored Peter. It's found on page 9, if you want to read alongside. It's entitled, Do You Love Me? Jesus loved His disciples dearly, even when they failed. His love for them caused Him to reach out and prevail. He singled Peter out and asked him most directly, Do you love me? This had, be, had to be answered personally. Peter did not dare to loudly declare his love as he once did. He had to eat his words, for he had denied his Lord indeed. But deep down in his heart, he knew he loved his master. Yes, Lord, you know I love you, was all he could muster. Two more times Jesus raised this question, do you love me? Peter would not use words that he was afraid would be empty. He would trust that the Lord knew what was deep in his heart. The lesson learned from having denied Jesus would never depart. Do you love me? Would, how would we answer the Lord today? Would we be able to declare our love without fear and dismay? The Lord bids us to search our hearts and speak of love for Him. May we be able to answer bravely that our love would never dim. Maybe we feel, we do feel like we have failed the Lord and we are not walking right. Would you seek that restoration? Do you love me? Was the question Jesus asked. Do you still love the Lord? And deep down, you know the answer to that question. Then come on back and find that renewal, 
in the Lord. And communion time is always a beautiful, wonderful time of just going, coming back to the Lord. And so we are going to partake of the bread and the cup very, very shortly, remembering how the Lord loved His disciples, how He gave Himself for them. And I like this song, No one ever cared for me like Jesus. This is a wonderful, faithful friend that we have in God. Let's be faithful to Him. Let's be having, He has blessed us. Let's never sin against Him. And we have stumbled and failed along the way. Here is the Lord reaching out to us all over again. Let's sing this together as we have the bread passed around this morning. No one ever cared for me like Jesus. And we have a wonderful friend in Jesus who cares for us. Sorry. But let's partake of this bread together prayerfully. Our Father, we thank you that we have a wonderful master in the Lord Jesus Christ who loves us, who cares for us, who protects us. May we be faithful to Him. May we walk with Him, love Him, honour Him in all that we do. And we thank You that even though the many times we have failed, He would still reach out for us and love us to restore us back to Himself. May we deepen our love for the Lord Jesus this day. Bless us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The cup represents the covenant that God made with us. The new covenant, a glorious covenant that was sealed by none other than the blood of Jesus. And the cup, the content is red, representing that blood, that commitment. Once it's sealed, God will not go back on His word. It's sealed. It is never going to be broken. And so when God made a covenant with us, sealed by the Lord, when we put our faith in Jesus, no matter where we will go, no matter how far we will be, God will come back and bring us back to Himself. That is a wonderful, precious truth to note. Oh, let's sing this song together. Oh, how I love Jesus. Let's love the Lord afresh, how wonderful He is to us, okay? Well, let's have this cup passed around. Let's sing this together. Let's partake of this cup prayerfully together. Our Father, we thank You for the love that You have for us that you would make us your children. We thank you for the love the Lord Jesus Christ had for us to give of himself, that we may know your love, to bear our sorrows and our pain, to always lead us back to yourself. We thank you that the fruit of love is by the Spirit of God, that we can love, that we can feel love, experience love for you as our God, the Lord as our Lord and Master, that we can love the church too, that we pray that you would deepen our love this morning. May we love you and serve you with a heart of love for all you have done for us. You have brought us through many trials. You have protected us. You have preserved our life. You have given to us a posterity, our children. Lord, may we live for you. May we know the joy of seeing your wonderful hand in our life and bless you for being there for us. We ask that you would hear this, our prayer, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let us give an offering, prepare an offering for the Lord this morning. From here, as we listen to the Lord's word and how God led Joseph.
that was there for Joseph. The Lord was with him. That was the phrase. The Lord was with him. And we thank God for the Lord being with us these 24 years at Bethel. We're going to celebrate 24 years as a church this September. And our encouragement is to look, whatever we are going through, in early years, oh, they were hard years. They were difficult. But the Lord saw us through all that and brought us here. Let's see God's hand all over again. Have faith in God. Let's encourage as many people as we can. From our own history. God's hand. In our own history. Look at how God has blessed. And we cannot but thank God. Encouraging people. No matter what you go through. Have faith in God. Let's sing this as our last hymn together. Let's rise as we sing this. 408. Have faith in God. Keep trusting Him. As we go through the challenges and the difficulties. Even though we cannot see His hands at times. Trust that He is there. Until we are able to see it. Okay? Well, let's sing this together. Have faith in God. Well, let's pray together. Let's keep on putting our faith in God. Even as we look to the week ahead. We, let's continue to walk by our faith in God. And now may this great God, who blessed Joseph, who blessed Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that same eternal God who blesses us today, may we hold firm to our faith. To know that the Lord is with us and He is able to prosper us. Help us to see His hand. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ enable us to trust Him through the trials of life. May the Spirit of God strengthen us to continue to live by our faith. To be faithful to the Lord Jesus who have loved us so much that we will deepen our love for Him too now and forevermore. Amen.